My name is Dan Bertrand Griffey, and this is my personal testimony. I'm going to tell you my testimony, and I'm just going to hit on the major points that made me give my life to Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I was born Daniel Bertrand of the Griffey family of Fort Worth, Texas. I mention this because of the circumstances of my condition at birth. I was born three months prematurely and weighed two and a half pounds. I had to stay in an incubator for a week to gain weight. No one thought I was going to live, not even my mother. She had had a miscarriage a few years before and did not want to get attached to a baby who all the doctors had told her probably would not survive more than a few days. In 1955, few premature babies survived the first week, and having one born three months prematurely, the doctors gave no hope to my family that I would ever leave the hospital. Every day after he got off work, my dad would come by the hospital, and holding me in his arms, he encouraged me to live with the words of his prayers. After a week of this and growing to a whopping five pounds, the doctors, in amazement, sent me home because they believed they would be filling out a death certificate they hadn't even taken the time to complete a birth certificate. That's why my birth certificate reads five pounds at birth. My mother and her sister came to the hospital to pick me up. They had brought a shoebox to carry me in. They were afraid to hold me because I was still so frail. At home, my brothers and my sister were on watch when the family cat was around because my mother had told them I was so frail and small that the cat might try to drag me off and eat me. But God had things for me to do. He did not intend for me to end up as cat food. I was sick and frail throughout my childhood, with every problem you could think of, chronic asthma and epilepsy to name a few. As a small child, I had to walk around with a string around my neck that ran through a big eraser, so that if I went into an epileptic fit, my sister or my brothers were to shove this big eraser into my mouth so it wouldn't bite off my tongue. For many years, I could not play games with other kids. I could only sit and watch. This concentrated observation taught me to observe everything going on around me. When I got to be about four years old, my father, who was an author, would let me sit in his office and watch him write if I didn't make any noise. I saw him sitting there grasping images that were forming in his mind like a blacksmith hammering his thoughts into words with every strike of the typewriter keys, as sweat poured down his face. This was Texas before home refrigerated air conditioning. All he had to cool the hot air was a swamp cooler. That image would stay with me for the rest of my life, the image of a blacksmith hammering out choice words upon a white anvil in an ancient blacksmith sweatshop, his mental muscles flexing with every thought burned itself forever into my psyche. The scene made such an impression on my young mind, I guess that's why I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. In the 50s, television was a very new form of creative expression, so my dad watched it to see other creative people's work. I would sit on the couch beside him to keep me quiet so that I wouldn't ask so many questions. He invented a game to play with me. We would watch the mystery programs, and the first one that would explain the twists and turns the plot was going to take and how it would end was the winner. As a small child, through this television game, my dad created the Lord taught me not to get so distracted by events in the story, but to see through those events into the actual message. 
This acquired training became crucial many years later in studying the Bible to discern biblical prophecy and applying it to events that would happen during the Great Tribulation period. Because I was very sickly and frail, my dad would tell me a story about a kid in his hometown in Kentucky who was much worse off than me. He had asthma so bad he could only take a few steps and then succumb to exhaustion and collapse on the floor. His father would carry him in his arms to the train tracks that ran by their house. After dinner, there was plenty of fresh air on those tracks. The boy would take as many steps as he could as he counted the number of railroad ties to gauge his progress. At first, he could only walk five or six ties and then collapse to the ground. His father, with encouraging words, would pick him up in his arms and carry him back to the house. Every day the father and son would do this, and he would add a few more railroad ties to his count every day. Much time passed, and he began to run the ties. He ran faster and faster, day after day. This became a habit, and the practice became a pattern in his life. Everybody in town watched as he ran daily, like the wind, on the railroad tracks. The town's people knew the story of a father who encouraged his son, and a son who overcame great difficulties to achieve freedom of movement. My dad's story ends with a boy becoming a very fast young man, representing the United States in the World Olympics. Now, I don't know if this is a true story or a story my dad made up, being the creative person he was, but it worked to motivate me. The latest information on premature babies has shown that they have difficulty in school because it is believed the development of their minds was not complete in the womb and their mind had to catch up as they grew. School was very hard for me, and this is no understatement, especially grammar school or elementary school. I found out that nobody wanted to be friends with one of the dumbest kids in the school. And every recess, I couldn't go out to play. I had to attend a special education class with about five or six other students. At the end of the sixth grade, on graduation day, I looked back at my time at the school and realized that I only had one friend a kid named David Ballard. On the last day of school, I found myself standing near a rail on the playground when all the other kids had long gone home. I was feeling dumb, friendless, and depressed. Even at that young age, I wanted more out of life than I had already received. It was then and there, in that state of mind, that I negotiated a deal with God. I told him that if he would make me popular at the other school I was leaving to go to, a junior high school, and then after that high school, I would someday give my life completely over to him. To fast forward, that is what happened. My grades improved the following year and my popularity increased with every grade and every year after that. I found myself with the whole school as my friend. No longer sick and weak, I even played football. In my junior year of high school, things began to change. Heaven started pushing events around in my life to produce a decisive change. I was 17 years old, and heaven sent me a dream that was a spiritual outline for the rest of my life. I knew when I had the dream that it was from God. It was to show me the future of the world, especially the biblical tribulation period. In this dream, I found myself stepping down a spiral staircase. Each step represented the Lord directing the events of my life. 
leading to a room at the bottom of the stairs. In this room was a large table, like a kitchen table, except larger. Around the table were a few women, no more than four or five in number. I sat down at the table with them, and in front of us were Bibles. As we discussed the Bible, outside the room a loud horn sounded like a trumpet. When this happened, I looked up from my Bible and saw that none of the other people were looking up. I said, Did you hear that? They replied, Hear what? That horn. Did you hear that horn? They said, We heard nothing. I told them, I am going to find out what that is. And I got up and went outside to see. Outside I looked up in the sky and saw the sun, much larger than usual, and the moon and stars still in the sky. The sun and the stars became dark from one end of the sky to the other, and after that they fell from the sky. Only the moon was left. Then the moon turned blood red. People came running out of their houses like crazy people when this happened. They ran down the street, screaming all the time, then from different parts of the landmass. As far as I could see, people began to ascend out of the ground straight from their graves into the air, their hands clasped in prayer, dressed in radiant white robes, with their faces looking upward, singing the hallelujah chorus from Handel's Messiah. Multitudes of them disappeared into the clouds. A horrible realization came to me that I was still on the ground, I had not been as the Christians predicted, raptured off the planet. The sins of my heart and mind all came before me, and I fell on my knees, crying to the Lord God, Have mercy on me, and do not leave me behind. Then I found myself rising in the air, but I did not go into the clouds as the others. Nor was I dressed in a white robe like the others. I was suspended below the clouds with many others, who were all still dressed in street clothes. After a large group had gathered, we began to move in mass over all the earth's surfaces. We crossed over every continent and nation as we did. People came out of these nations and began to float up into the air to join us. By the time we had crossed over every country on earth, our group had grown quite large. Millions of people flew in the air with us. We flew in the Middle East to the Holy Land. In Jerusalem, there had been built a colossal building waiting to receive us. It looked like a huge barn on the top of a high hill. We all flew into it and its walls begin to bulge out because of our number. Inside this colossal barn, we saw a large window on its far wall. From without, you could not see this window, only from the inside. We knew that to enter heaven, we had to crash through the window. This was the window that the scripture says, we see through a glass darkly, and that ended the dream. I know now this dream was the second exodus. In the latter part of my junior year in high school, I woke up from that dream, knowing that something big had just happened. What was also so different about this dream was that I had total recall of it. I could play back any portion of it at any time. Forty-nine years after the dream, I still can at any time. After that dream, 
I could feel the presence of something heavenly, something good, near me almost all the time. I knew I wasn't a Christian, but that I, without a doubt, believed that God existed. And I knew that knowing that in itself did not make me a Christian. Satan knew God existed, and he was no Christian. At 18, I knew I had more in common with Satan than with God. I wasn't ready to give up the partying and the girls just yet. Powerful dreams are no powerful dream. I seem to know that that is why I always sensed a heavenly presence around me, but I knew it was not coming from within me. After graduating high school, I went to college in East Texas. Before classes started, I was invited to join or was rushed into a fraternity. The frat guys took me and some other guys to a lake water skiing. The water was very cold and I came down with bronchial pneumonia that night in the dorm room. I refused to leave college for a hospital back in Fort Worth, and the hospital in the city where the school was, the school physician told me I would never make it out of that hospital alive because they were so poorly trained. So for the first three weeks of college, I hung on to my life in my dorm room coughing up buckets of phlegm from my lungs, which seemed never to empty out. I started college with 250 pounds of muscle, thinking about trying out for the football team. I was all muscle and no fat. Three weeks into college, I weighed under 200 pounds and was still dropping. I even prayed to God to heal me. After three weeks of fighting for my life, flat on my back, and very weak from coughing all the time. The Lord answered, came that night. His words to me were short and to the point. You're going to die. When I heard that voice, whether in my head or heart, I could not tell. I was very sick. At that point, I pushed everything else in my life to the side, college, football, fraternity, girls, everything. The Lord of the universe had my undivided attention. I don't understand. Why must I die? I'm only 19 years old, was what I said. The Lord's reply was, We made a deal when you were in the sixth grade and I kept my side of the deal, but you have not kept yours, so you're going to die. After the shock of hearing that, my response was, you did keep your end of the deal, and although I do not know how to give my life to you, I will keep my end of the deal also. The next day, three weeks after college had started, I found myself sitting in my first college class, I must have looked like death warmed over, thin, weak, and no longer sick. There I sat, grinning ear to ear. I was still not a Christian. I didn't quite know how to do that yet. That would not happen till summer break after my freshman year. At a home Bible study, I was invited to. When I walked into the man's house that had invited me and sat down with the five other people at his kitchen table. The first part of my dream came true. The guy leading the study said he had a dream the night before that we should study a specific verse. They were kind enough to open a Bible and turn it to that verse and hand it to me, sliding it across the kitchen table. As my eyes crossed the page of the Bible, a verse cut my eyes, and I could not take my eyes off of that verse. I mean, literally could not take my eyes off that verse. I could not move my eyes from that verse. The other people noticed I was looking 
at the wrong verse. They then pointed to the verse we were to study, but I could not remove my eyes from the verse they were fixed to. They tried physically moving the Bible. I was looking at across the table to a different place on the table. And then they tried pushing my head down when that didn't work, so my eyes would be looking at the verse we were going to study. But it was no use. My eyes were not cooperating. Then the leader said, Read the verse you are looking at. So I did. And before I read that scripture, I need to back up a little bit here. When the people who had invited me to this Bible study and the people giving the Bible study started the study, they did it by prayer. Not the kind of prayer I was used to. You see, I was raised Southern Baptist, and we prayed quietly to ourselves, not out loud, except for a special prayer, like a leader would give in a large group where one person is saying the prayer for the whole group. But these people, I was to find out later, were Pentecostals, Holy Ghost filled with the evidence of speaking in tongues, Pentecostals. Now, I didn't know anything about Pentecostals. When they began praying, I nearly came out of my chair. Their way of praying was anything but quiet and reserved. And within that prayer was what they called their heavenly prayer language. When I heard that, I nearly bolted for the front door. I thought for sure. I, a young college student, had fallen in with a bunch of devil-worshipping occultists who were planning on drugging me and sacrificing me spread out on that kitchen table. So with a genuine fear for my life, I bowed my head, and in my mind I prayed, Lord, if these people are of you, and you have sent me to them, you had better tell me, because if not, I'm out of here. Now we get back to the verse my eyes would not move away from. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 6, and it reads, Not too many people of a strange speech, of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent you to them. The verse goes on. But that was all I could read. When I read this verse, that sent everybody around the table screaming, Praise the Lord and Hallelujah! Again, I thought I was going to hit that front door and not look back. Scripture answer from God or not. The leader even fell out of his chair. He got so excited. That was it for the Bible study after that. Everyone in the Bible study wanted to go into the next room and pray. So we got up and walked over to the living room. I let them all get in front of me, still thinking they might plunge the sacrificial dagger into my back. I kept all of them where I could see them. Everybody got down on their knees on the carpet. That was okay. That was Christian. Then they began their loud prayers. When I was sure everybody was in front of me, I knelt at the coffee table and began praying silently. Then they started speaking in tongues again, which nearly made me jump out of my skin. I looked over at the front door, which was a lot closer now, and I saw that no one was between me and it. At that moment, a voice to my right side said, These people are of the devil. You'd better run out that front door. That sounded like the most logical thing I had heard all night. So I quickly started rising off my knees and preparing to make a dash for the door. All of a sudden, halfway up, I was stopped two huge hands on my shoulders. 
not realizing it at the time, but hands this big would have had to come from a very large giant. Thinking that everyone that had been at the kitchen table was kneeling before me, they must have had this big guy hiding in the back room. He's the guy who will hold me down on the table while they plunge the sacrificial dagger in my, into my chest. Slowly, I turned my head not to excite this big guy, but I wanted to get a look at who I was going to have to fight to get out of here. I looked behind me, but there was no one there. No one. Yet the huge hands were still resting on my shoulders, holding me down. I turned back toward the coffee table, going down on my knees, praying like I'd never prayed before. Not the Southern Baptist prayer. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. It was then and there that I got filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Tongues is a prayer language, kind of like baby gibberish at first. So after a couple of weeks of praying like this, I began to wonder, is this how the first church in Jerusalem prayed? Two weeks after the first Bible study, I was on my knees in that living room at the coffee table again, asking the Lord if that was really how the first Christians prayed. As I was praying out loud, speaking in tongues, my eyes closed, my head bowed, in the prayer, I opened my eyes while I was raising my head, and there on my chest was a long white beard down to my waist. All of a sudden, I was a very old man with a white beard. I looked around the room I was in, and the walls were like mud plaster, and the whole house was only one room. Behind me was a square raised cooking place where one would make a fire with wood. There was a hole in the roof to let the smoke out, and a hollowed-out gourd was hanging on a post that was part of the cooking structure. There were two younger women in the room who were dressed in long robes like they used to wear in the Middle East. I had an understanding that all three of us were Christians and we were all praying for our lives. Because outside the one door in the room, I knew that Roman soldiers were coming down the street, kicking doors in and dragging people out to the street to be slaughtered by their swords. I knew I was in Jerusalem, and it was the first century A.D. The women were my daughters. We were Christian Jews praying for a miracle, praying in tongues. Now this was nothing to do with reincarnation, and I'm not suggesting it was, or anything like that. This was God taking me back in time and showing me what happened in the first century. The Lord told me he did not want me to return to college, so my conclusion was he wanted me to go to the seminary to be a preacher man. When I asked him, he said, No. I tried very hard that summer to convince the Lord that in our society, in today's world, without a college education, you won't amount to much. How did he expect me to do something for him if I didn't become a minister? And to do that, I needed to go to the seminary. To impress my point, I knew the largest seminary in the world was in my hometown in Fort Worth. So I drove over to it at 12 o'clock midnight when I knew no good Baptist student would be awake. And before the rotunda on the outer front steps of the world's largest ministry school, I pleaded with God to let me attend the school. 
with tears in my eyes and my Bible open to impress him, and my finger pointed at some scripture I thought would persuade him. He gave me his answer. The Lord of all creation said, No. And then he said, Don't ask me again. In the fear of the Lord, I shut up and collapsed on the stairs next to the rotunda, next to where I was had placed my Bible. After what seemed to be a long time, a wind came up, and pages of my Bible started turning by the wind, and then the wind stopped as quickly as it had started. I looked over at the pages, and again my eyes locked on a verse that had just leaped off the pages at me. As I began to read the verse, a small voice spoke in my ear and said, I am an angel sent by the Lord. Then I read the Bible verse, Job 27th chapter. I will teach you by the hand of God that which is with the Almighty will I not conceal. I knew I had my answer. I could tell you of many more spiritual things that happened to me during the next 47 years after these events as I walked with the Lord, but none of them are as important as the understanding and insight the Lord has given me in dealing with Bible prophecy and the events that will unfold during the tribulation period. The books I have written, the audio books I have recorded, and the DVD that has been produced must speak for themselves. If they are true, and the Word of God verifies their truth, and the Holy Spirit within you will bear witness of it. My name is Dan Bertrand Griffey, and this is my testimony. May God bless and keep you and yours. In Jesus' name.